Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Cruz, thank you very much. And live now for remarks from Labor Secretary Alex Acosta, White House Counselor Kellyanne Conway, and Iowa Republican Senator Joni Ernst, who is expected to speak first. They're all at the National Association of Counties Legislative Conference here in Washington. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 2. Iowa's auditor, where she worked to eliminate wasteful government spending and protect taxpayer resources. In 2014, Senator Ernst was elected as the first woman to serve in federal elected office from Iowa and also became the first female combat veteran elected to the United States Senate. Please join me in welcoming Senator Joni Ernst. Oh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Washington, D.C. Is it? Yeah, good morning, and thank you. Greg, thank you for the kind introduction. As Greg said, I am Joni Ernst, and I have the great honor of serving Iowans in the United States Senate, and I'm very happy to be here today with, with all of you. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to have so many county leaders um, from all over the country here in the same room. And I know there are a number of Iowans here. Where did they go? Yay, okay, there's my Iowans, great. And, and I wanted to give them a special shout out. We were able to visit a little bit today about a number of issues that are, are very important to all of you. Well, many of the folks here from Iowa know this, the rest of you may not. Um, I did get my start in politics at the county level, and I first ran for county auditor in my home county of Montgomery in 2004. I held that position until 2011 when I was elected to the Iowa State Senate. And much of what I learned and experienced as a county official has informed my work in the United States Senate. And perhaps most importantly, working as a county auditor gave me a true appreciation for the importance of local control. So many of our state and federal programs are administered or implemented by or in partnership with local governments. Local government is truly where the rubber meets the road. And for this reason, when I'm looking at a policy issue here in Washington, my first thought is always, what do the folks on the ground have to say about this particular issue? And I rely on local officials across Iowa to give me the information and feedback I need to make informed decisions. I understand that not everyone can make it to Washington, D.C. to meet with me, so I've made it a point to visit all of Iowa's 99 counties every single year. And that's right, folks, 99 counties every single year. And I'm not the only one that does this. I'm following in the great footsteps of our senior senator, Chuck Grassley, who's done the 99 county tour every year for now going on over 38 years. <laughs> Kudos to Senator Grassley. I know that President Trump also puts a premium on input from all of you, and I was glad to see him invite every county commissioner and supervisor in the country to the White House over his first two years in office. And if you're familiar with some of my work in the Senate, you'll know that one of my top priorities is to cut bureaucratic red tape and get rid of regulations that don't make sense. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> President Trump has been working very hard on this, too. And based on the feedback I received from folks like you, I led the effort in the Senate to scrap the burdensome 2015 Waters of the U.S. or WOTUS rule. Yes. It's probably the number one issue I received uh, feedback on. And while the effort in 2015 was ultimately vetoed by President Obama, the EPA has recently proposed a rewrite of the rule that I think is reasonable and will provide much needed certainty for our stakeholders. I know that your organization found the 2015 rule challenging, and again, I heard many, many comments on that, and I'm hopeful that the new iteration of WOTUS will alleviate the con concerns that you had about that difficult rule. 
Because you are in the best position to determine what's working and what isn't, I think it's not only important to listen to you, but also to empower you. For this reason, I am supportive of policies that delegate as much authority as possible to the state and the local governments. My good friend and colleague, Senator Chuck Grassley, the senior senator from Iowa, often refers to DC as an island surrounded by reality. And, co and Congress and federal agencies don't always know what's best for those off the island. And your engagement with us and the valuable input you provide helps bring a much needed dose of reality to this city. To make it easier for our local officials to participate in and influence the policy making process, I introduced a bill last Congress that would require the headquarters of executive branch agencies to be re relocated outside of the Washington DC metro area. States and cities would be able to compete to become their new homes. This would bring good government jobs to new parts of the country and I think it would also result in a more sensible policy making. And this is something that my Iowa folks and I were just talking about behind stage a little bit ago. Uh, we would love the opportunity to compete for some of these headquarters, and it just makes sense. Um, for example, the USDA, US Department of Agriculture. I don't know of too many farmers and ranchers right here in the DC metro area. It would be great for them to move out into those states that they actually represent. I'm sure many of you are wondering how the new dynamic in Congress will affect what happens on the Hill over the next few years. And as all of you know, after two years of unified Republican control, we now have a divided Congress. And while I'm sure that you will see a lot in the news, um, of course, about the dysfunction and infighting in Washington, what I want you to know and what you should know is that bipartisanship is still alive and well in Congress. You know, we will continue to work together. There are still some things that both sides agree are very important. Infrastructure is one of them. In the near future, we'll begin work on the next surface transportation bill, the highway bill. And I'm hopeful that talk of a potential infrastructure package heats right back up again. Republicans and Democrats have some differences on how we pay for infrastructure and what kind of things might actually qualify in that package, but we all agree it is something that needs to be addressed. Another area where both sides came together to accomplish a common goal was the passage of the bipartisan farm bill. These programs, like conservation, something that's important to our folks back home in Iowa, will ha now have five years of stability to look forward to, providing much needed certainty and allowing industries to focus on other major issues facing our economy, like trade. Last year, the administration successfully renegotiated our free trade agreement with Canada and Mexico. I hope to see Congress swiftly approve this new agreement that will provide certainty to American businesses who export to two of our largest trading partners. I also hope that as the process moves forward, the administration can shift its focus to addressing the looming steel and aluminum tariffs with Mexico, Mexico and Canada and finalizing our negotiations with China. Iowans continue to tell me that they are glad that President Trump is finally standing up to China and holding them accountable for their unfair trade practices. There is no denying that these ongoing trade negotiations have been hard on counties across the country, but they give us an opportunity to create new market access for our farmers and manufacturers. I'm encouraged by the recent reports that negotiators have made substantial progress in our trade talks with China. I hope we seize this opportunity and reach a final agreement soon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>
We would, we would love to see this done very, very soon. With new and open markets, America's counties, both urban and rural, can thrive. So again, folks, thank you very much for hosting me here this morning. It's great to have the opportunity uh, to be at this event with you. Uh, I want to thank you for all that you do and to update you on what's going on in Washington, D.C. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you. I know I'm always amongst friends when I'm with county officials. So God bless you all for the work that you do. And God bless these great United States of America. Thank you all so much. Have a great time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Ernst. Counties play a critical role in fostering conditions for economic growth, including labor market policies and closing the workforce skills gap. Next, we welcome Secretary of the United States Department of Labor, Alexander Acosta. The son of Cuban refugees, Senator Acosta has held several presidentially appointed leadership roles in labor relations and justice. Most recently, Secretary Acosta served as the Dean of the Florida International University College of Law. Please join me in welcoming the 27th United States Secretary of Labor, Alexander Acosta. Good morning. Well, thank you, Mr. Cox, for the kind introduction. You know, this is a, a great time to, to speak with all of you because our economy is booming. You all know the statistics, the unemployment rate, the job creation rate. I want to share uh, a few different ones with you this morning that I thought, that I recently heard and I thought were particularly important. Wages are increasing at the fastest rate that we have seen for nearly a decade. But here's the really interesting part. Wages for the bottom decile of individuals increased 6.5% over the past year. That's really incredible. And we've seen all these new hires, and that's great. 70% of all those new hires were from outside the labor force, were individuals that hadn't been working or even looking for a job that looked at our economy and decided, we want to work, and joined the labor force. And here's one other. The wages for individuals who make things, goods producing industries, those who make things, those who build things, those who construct things, those who manufacture things. For non-supervisory goods producing employees increased more than $2,500 last year. That makes a big difference to an individual and to a family. And I wanted to share those with you because I think it reflects the truth about this economy. And the truth is that this economy is getting not just more people back to work, but more people back to work that weren't thinking of working before, more people in jobs that are paying better and better. You know, the quit rate is something we don't talk about much, but it's at an almost record high. The quit rate is the rate at which people quit their jobs because they find another and better opportunity. And that's a reflection of this economy. So what are the challenges? The challenges are preparing individuals and offering them the skills that this economy is looking for. And so for the first time in history, for month after month after month, we've seen something we've never seen before. We've seen more open jobs than individuals looking for jobs. So I want to talk a little bit about this and a little bit about how we can approach this together. And I say together because all of you are very much our partners in this. 84% of counties have formed workforce training partnerships with local chambers of commerce, cities, states, 
state governments, forget not 84%, 100% of counties have done that. All of you are focused on workforce. Many of you are part of our workforce boards or chair our workforce boards. And you understand that workforce investment lays the ground for a future. So what are we doing and how can we partner together? Well, the Pledge to America's workers brought together businesses and industry that pledge to reskill, upskill, provide opportunities, and so far we've had pledges for more than 6.5 million opportunities. Apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are another incredibly important approach. You know, as we look out there into this economy, I think we need to take a step back and evaluate what signals do we send to young Americans? I was in Missouri last week, and I was touring an apprenticeship facility for the United Brotherhood of Carpenters. And it was great. And they were getting skills, and they were learning. And when they were done with their apprenticeship, they were 15 credits short of a college degree because they had an articulation agreement with their local community college. But here's what I found most impressive about it. They showed me their rate sheet. When young men and women left that apprenticeship program, their lowest starting wage was $28 an hour. That's a, that is a good family sustaining wage. And so the question is, what signals are we sending to young Americans? Are we saying you only have one path to success and all other paths are no good? Or are we saying there are multiple paths? Are we saying you can go to college, you can study, you can go be a lawyer or a doctor. Now you're gonna make a good wage and you're gonna have lots of debt and it's gonna take a while. Or you can go be an apprentice carpenter and you can go build something and you won't have student debt and it won't take as long and you'll also have a good wage. And decide what you love and pursue what you love and choose what you love and what makes you happy because the goal is a family sustaining wage. Is that the signal that we're sending in high schools? If it's not, as county officials, as local officials, what should you be doing about that? I think this is so important because we have young Americans out there that might not pursue education because they're told it's college or bust, rather than they're told there are multiple paths to success. And so apprenticeships are something that we are talking about quite a bit. I'm very proud that since we started talking about this, over the last two years, we have reached almost 500,000 new apprenticeships. Yeah. And we're in the final process we have pending at the Office of Management and Budget. The comment period closed and we've provided our comments on the final application for industry-recognized apprenticeships. So we can have registered apprenticeships and industry-recognized apprenticeships with the goal of achieving one million new apprentices over the coming year. We've rolled out our apprenticeship.gov website, and it has three parts. One is for career seekers looking for jobs. One is for educators so they can talk about their programs and a third is for employers. And there's an artificial intelligence aspect to this that identifies opportunities for apprentices and puts them up there. I have a request, when you go back home, look up the apprenticeship.gov website. Think about whether there are ways to plug in the opportunities in your county into that website so that more individuals can see it. Now over the next month, actually this month, we're gonna be announcing grants of 150 million to community colleges to further support apprenticeships. These grants are a little different. We asked community colleges to find matching 
partners in the business community. The Department of Labor has never done that before. And so why did we do this? What's more powerful, a community college program unattached to the local economy or a community college program with business partners that have put in their dollars into the program so that that community college is providing the skills those businesses need, so that those businesses are invested, not just through a membership on a board, but through their dollars in those community college programs. And I bet you that curriculum is focused on the local skills that are required. And I bet you that when it comes time, those businesses that invested in those programs are going to hire the individuals that are graduating. And so those $150 million that are, of, that are going to be awarded are actually more powerful than that because it has a one for three match. So in essence, it's going to be $200 million to community colleges to foster these programs. And I'm very, I should say, we're going to announce a second round of grant opportunity because I'm very excited about the concept of having businesses and community colleges come together in a partnership it is a win-win. Businesses get the skills that they're asking for. They get input into the community college system. Community colleges get financial support. And they get insight into the skills that are being required. Now, I want to talk about some other challenges to the workforce. Because while we have a very low unemployment rate, our labor force participation should increase. And that's why I said it's so important that 70% of new jobs are going to individuals outside the labor force, individuals that aren't working. And we need to engage those individuals so much more. And so I want to talk a little bit about individuals that are leaving prison. The best thing that we, that you, can do for those individuals is help them find a job. The best thing you can do for the economy is help those individuals become part of an economy rather than recidivate. And the best thing you can do for your community and the safety of your community is give those individuals a job and a stake in the community, again, because that is the biggest predictor for individuals not recidivating. And so reentry is so important. We put out about 85 million in reentry grants, and we're going to be doing a second round. Later this March, we're going to be having a conference where we're going to invite reentry organizations to Washington. And we want to provide them with information about all the opportunities that are available federally to get support and to get assistance. This is so important. And one, one note on this. You know, I was visiting a prison, and it had a culinary program. And I thought that was great. And I asked, what's the biggest obstacle when you leave to finding a job? And in this particular state, and I'm going to talk about licensing in a minute, chefs had to be licensed. And if you had a felony, you couldn't get that license. When you go back home, think hard, and I know it's very difficult, and I know there are a lot of local interests, but think hard, does every license that excludes a felon really need to exclude that felon? Is it really the case that someone that doesn't have, that, that has a record can't install fire alarms or can't be a chef? is the best thing for society to exclude individuals from job opportunities. There's another national workforce challenge that I want to talk about, and that's opioid abuse. You know, Princeton professor Alan Kruger, and I cite him in particular to show how bipartisan this issue is, because he worked for President Obama. He did a survey, and he found that 47% almost half of prime age men who are not in the labor force 
took a painkiller not last month, not last week, but yesterday. 47% of men, 25 to 54, not in the labor force, took a painkiller yesterday. And the follow-up question, was it a prescription painkiller? And about a third said yes. So a third of men not working took a prescription painkiller yesterday. That's a problem, folks. That's a real problem, not just for those individuals, but for our economy. And so we have to work together on this opioid issue. It is so important. The Department of Labor is sponsoring some pilot programs. When individuals go into treatment facilities, treatment can often take months. What are they doing while they're being treated? Are they watching television? Or are they preparing for the next phase of their life? So what the Department of Labor is doing is providing funding for workforce training while someone's undergoing treatment. Because at, <laughs> at the end of treatment, if someone does not have a job, again, what are the chances that they're gonna go right back into their former lifestyle? I also wanna talk about a second program that I saw, and I thought it was so interesting. And this was in Belden, Indiana. Belden works with employees. This was a, a, a tour that I took um, in Indiana. Belden works with employees who have tested positive. And they're able to do this because of a unique law in Indiana. See, in Indiana, if you test positive and you undergo certain steps, like this pathway to employment that I'm gonna talk about, there is a liability shield against the employer if something goes wrong. And so the employer is incentivized to do this. And so this is what the pathway to employment is about. If a potential employee is denied employment due to a filled drug test, they have a chance to participate in a personalized rehab program. They go in, they get assessed, and if there's a likelihood of rehabilitation, they can keep their job. They might be transferred to a different job category within the employer, but they can stay working so long as they stay in treatment and they stay clean. So I met this gentleman. He'd been working for about 15 years. Then he went on drugs. And I asked him why. His daughter had been arrested and went to jail. Pretty tough. Here's the question. Is he better off continuing to work so long as he stays in treatment and stays clean? Or is he better off being fired? and going home and going into a negative feedback loop where he's like, I don't have a job, my daughter's in jail, what's the point? Taking more drugs and then getting more depressed. The fact that in Indiana there are mechanisms, legal mechanisms to keep people in their jobs is a very, very good thing. And I'd ask when you go back home to think about that and think about what all of you could do so that you incentivize employers where appropriate to keep individuals employed because people do make mistakes. But when they've made a mistake, keeping that attachment to the workforce is critical because once they leave that workforce, it's really, really hard to re-engage. Now let me talk about occupational licensing. There was once a time when only one in 20 jobs required a license. Now there are different measures. Some say one in three, some say one in four, some say one in five jobs require a license. But whether it's 20, 25, or 
that is, is way, way, way too many jobs that require license. I was in one state where the license to install fire alarms was more expensive than the license to practice as a lawyer. Think about that. You are, not you all, but, but the system is imposing financial burdens often on those who can least afford them. A city recently came up with a license for dog walking. Not for babysitting, that's okay, but dog walking needs a license. And so the Federal Reserve has estimated, the Federal Reserve study out of Minneapolis, that 1.4 million Americans aren't working because of this. Another study said 1.9 million. Brookings estimated 3 million. This is a very hard issue because at the local level it's very difficult to unlicense, and I fully acknowledge that. But it's also an incredibly important issue for workforce. And one of the reasons why is because it discourages people to move into your counties and states. Geographic mobility, which in our society should be at an all-time high, is actually pretty darn low. And it's low because when individuals are thinking, should I move, one of the questions is, how hard is it to get a job in the other state? How hard is it to relicense? And I want to talk about that issue in particular in one context. And I think that this is such an easy, there's such an easy answer here that there is no reason why every state shouldn't take action. I want to talk about that in the context of military spouses. There are a few of you in the room that know about this. Our men and women in the armed forces serve our nation and defend each and every one of us. And often, typically, we recruited them as an individual. And along the line, they got married and started a family. And so the military is having a little difficulty retaining these families. And I say retaining the family because you can recruit an individual, but you retain a family. And these are high-skilled individuals. And I think military spousal license is one of the reasons why. So I want to tell you a story about a military spouse who is providing health coaching for nearly four years in one state. And then the military service person was transferred to another Air Force base and continued to provide health coaching online to former clients until the spouse got a cease and desist because a dietitian in the new state was complaining that this person was practicing without a license in that new state. So you move to a new state, you continue to communicate with your former clients, you continue to do what was perfectly legal, what was your job, what was your career, but this new state tells you, stop your career. You may be married to someone who's serving the nation, but the nation does not want you to practice your career. Her name is Heather, and the story is not unique. It happens to tens of thousands of military spouses every year. I met an attorney who ended up getting a job at a supermarket because of a licensing issue. We could call in for story after story after story. This just isn't right. And so if you take on licensing, first I would say if licenses aren't necessary, eliminate them. And if you can't do that politically, at least, at least focus on military spouses. 
it's not that hard to say if a military spouse is domiciled in our state because a military service member is there on orders, they can continue their career so long as they're licensed in their home state and so long as there is no disciplinary action against them. I don't know how folks can be against that. These are individuals that are serving our nation, and the spouse is serving right alongside them and should not have to sacrifice his or her career. Let me wrap up by just saying, as a general approach, one size does not fit all. We believe very much in the importance of having flexibility and variability. And so across our programs, to the extent the Department of Labor has flexibility, to the extent the Department of Labor has pilot project authority, we welcome the opportunity to work with each and every one of you for outside the box programming. We have granted almost every WIOA waiver that we have been asked for because one size does not fit all. New York is different than Iowa, which is different than Texas and California and Alaska. And so if governors want to change things up a little bit, ask for the waiver. If workforce boards want flexibility, ask for waivers. We can't do this at the federal level. Workforce education has to happen at the local level. And to the extent we have flexibility and authority, we will push it out to all of you. We trust you. You have every incentive to do what is right for your community. And you know what is right much better than we do. And so I thank you for your efforts. All those individuals looking for jobs and holding jobs, thank you for your efforts. And as you go back home, please, two things. Think about how to better empower local educators to realize there are multiple paths to success. We need to stop thinking that there are only certain jobs because every job can lead to success if folks love it and if it provides a family-sustaining wage. And secondly, think about military spouses. What's happening to them is wrong. Thank you for all your efforts. Thank you, Secretary Acosta. We appreciate your presence here today. Today, we're announcing a new partnership with the National Sheriff's Association. I'd like to invite Jonathan Thompson, who is the Executive Director of the National Sheriff's, Sheriff's Association, to join me on the stage as we announce a new task force to address one of the greatest challenges facing county governments. As county leaders, we focus on solutions. This task force will examine the Medicaid inmate exclusion policy, which strips federal health and veterans benefits from individuals upon admission to jail, not upon conviction, terminating federal benefits from those who are presumed innocent is a violation of their constitutional rights. It also It also leads to increased recidivism and increased burdens on local taxpayers. With more than 2 million people in jail with serious mental illnesses, disorders, and substance use disorders, continuity of care can help stop the revolving door of incarceration. Our task force 
will study this serious problem and offer solutions and policy recommendations to Congress and the administration. This is the right thing to do. We are pleased to name the members of this task force. You can see the names of those individuals on the screen behind me. They've got a big job in front of them, and I know that they're up to the, the task that is being presented to them. We thank these county leaders, including sheriffs, prosecutors, and behavioral health experts, and we hope you all will join us at our policy briefing tomorrow afternoon on Capitol Hill. And we look forward to working with Jonathan and the National Sierras Association in the months ahead. Jonathan, I want to give you an opportunity to say a few words. Good morning. Good morning. That's the county associations I know. We have a crisis confronting us. I don't need to repeat the numbers, but I do need to make a couple of observations. Every day in this country, more than 300,000 individuals are in our jails, in your jails, for one reason only, because they are mentally ill. That illness caused them or their communities harm because of no other reason than they had an illness. Today, as we sit here, our federal government has an obligation. It's part of the moral and social code we must share. To me, a father of two children that have mental illnesses, we can't do this alone. We cannot arrest our way out of the opioid crisis, and we certainly can't arrest our way out of the mental illness crisis facing this country. <laughs> Asking sheriffs, jail administrators, county executives, county board members, commissioners, city councils to carry this burden is unconscionable. This is our humanitarian obligation. We must treat these people with dignity. We must treat them with respect. But please, please, stop putting them in jails. Put them where they belong. Tomorrow, you get to talk to Congress about it. Share those personal stories that you have, because you do have them. Tell them about the 17-year-old who woke up one day because he had schizophrenia and couldn't control his rage. Tell them about the 35-year-old with PTSD who did nothing more than decide that it was so hot out he had to take his clothes off to stay cool. Tell them about those family members that you probably have or know about who are in there in your custody now or in the sheriff's custody. We cannot. We cannot do this anymore. The most civilized nation in the world is locking up people for one reason, because they are mentally ill or addicted to a drug. Ladies and gentlemen, together we can fix this crisis. I ask you, I call upon you, I implore you, help us fix this problem. Thank you. God bless you all. Jonathan, we thank you and the National Sheriff's Association for being a partner with NACO on this very, very important issue. Well, while we're waiting for our next uh, guest speaker, uh, I'm supposed to do a little song and dance, I guess. So what I'm going to do is just kind of explain uh, my presidential initiative, which uh, is connecting the unconnected, and how I got to the point where I kind of felt this would be really an opportunity to build on Roy Charles Brooks's uh, initiative last year of serving the underserved with a particular focus on childhood poverty. 
You know, in San Diego County, we've been blessed. We had uh, a United Way that ran our information and referral line for a good number of years, and they decided they wanted to get into focusing on some other areas. And so we were kind of forced to put together a, a separate 501c3. And uh, we did that in 2005. It, it was about the same time the 211 phone number was, was coming together, and kudos to Atlanta for being the, the founder, I think, or the first one to implement a 211 phone line. And we uh, have had a very robust 211 phone system for a couple of years. We had some fires in 2007, but we had rolled 211 into not only being the typical health and human services information, but we also used it for disaster. We decided we use it for disaster information, non-emergency disaster information. And a couple of months after we decided to do that, we had some very bad fires in 2007. They handled 160,000 calls in the space of six days, giving people information on whether they needed to boil water, whether they could get back to their homes, what roads were open, where they could go to family assistance centers. And we realized that there's so much more that can be done with 211 than just having it uh, for health and human services information. So over the last few years, we've added having people report graffiti. They actually can take people's information when they call a 211 in San Diego. We blew all the silos away. And now 211 in San Diego, when somebody calls, the operators there that have been significantly trained will actually deal with real people that have real problems, and we focus on giving them real solutions. And uh, it has just been one of the most, I think, transformational experiences I've had. Uh, they're handling about 500,000 uh, calls and emails that are coming in, uh, online service that they have. And it has just made all the difference in the world. And one of the funding streams is as they sign people up for, for, for uh, food stamps, uh, they actually get reimbursed by the Department of Agriculture. That's one of the many ways that we fund 211 in San Diego. Well, I wanted to take that opportunity just to explain the genesis of my presidential initiative. Now it's uh, my honor to introduce our next guest speaker, Kellyanne Conway, who serves as special assistant to the president and senior counselor. She has led some of the administration's most high profile and impactful initiatives. Kellyanne will give us a look inside some of the administration's efforts over the past two years and some of their biggest accomplishments. Please join me in welcoming Kellyanne Conway. Thank you for having me. Well, Kellyanne, we are so delighted to have you as a part of uh, our proceedings this morning. You know, I have to tell you, I don't think I've ever seen any presidential administration uh, open the door more for access for local government than the Trump administration has done. I know that over the last... Uh, I know that over the last year, I think you had something like 35 different forums. Yes where you literally invited every county elected official in America to come in and meet with the president's administration, with cabinet sec secretaries, with uh, uh, speakers that just had tremendous informa information to share. And I know, I think I was a part of the last uh, delegation that came in. I know you were a big part of a lot of those um, efforts in, in a lot of those meetings, uh, California, Alaska, and uh, uh, Hawaii, I think, was the last the group last that came one. in That's in October, right. and we were honored to have the president himself come in and talk to us for about 20 minutes. But Kelly, tell me, um, what what has been the the uh, the feedback from the administration, the cabinet secretaries, and the others that have had a chance to to meet with county officials? Um, what has this meant to the administration? Well, thank you so much for having me today, and to everybody at NACO to have me at your conference. We could not do what we do and be who we are as administration literally without the input and the insights, the information, and really just the individual participation from our local elected officials and non-elected officials. Why is that? Because much like everything to President Trump, it all begins at the grassroots level. And he's been a chief executive his entire career, obviously, at the Trump Organization as a, a successful developer and builder. 
um, chief executive on TV. He'd like me to remind you also <coughs> at The Apprentice. And now chief executive of the United States. But at the executive level, he's always, always been very natural for him to rely upon uh, different individuals and organs, if you will, throughout a structure to make sure that he's provided with the information and the issues and the input. And he's very good, I think, about weighing many different opinions and then making a decision, executing on the decision. So we're the federal government. This is the White House. He's the president. It's wonderful that he's bringing voice and visibility and action on so many different issues. But we will never, let me make very clear to you, we will never substitute our judgment for yours. And the reason is we need to hear. We need a two-way, we need you to be a two-way conduit to bring to us what you're hearing and what you're seeing and experiencing at home locally. And then hearing from us what's happening. So a couple things that have happened, you know, everything from tackling the opioid crisis legislatively and through regulation, big bipartisan effort, big bipartisan effort on criminal justice reform. <laughs> Infrastructure has begun but will continue. We hope and we expect in a very bipartisan way in earnest this very Congress this year. Um, also, you look at anything having to do with, uh, let's just say, the water Resources Development Act that was signed into law um, in October, the FAA reauthorization in October. So these are things that maybe the average American doesn't hear and doesn't see in local coverage, but you know it and you feel it. And I just use those as some examples where we just can't make decisions on high and expect everybody to comply with them. We're receiving that input. It took me 50 years to get to my 50th state. Uh, <laughs> when I turned 50, I got to my, but I've been to all 50 now. Um, it took the White House about a year and a half to have all 50 states come in and send their representatives. And it's been an incredible important part of our own infrastructure, our intelligence and information infrastructure. Um, some of the best ideas that we have heard have been the best practices, and yes, the challenges, the op obstacles and the opportunities that we've heard from local elected officials. I can think of some right off the bat, but we did have 35 events, all 50 states represented. The president was there for a few of them. I think I participated in um, 27 of them, and the president uh, was came in at the last one for the crowning achievement. But I'll tell you that as different geographically and demographically and sometimes um, economically some of the states are, we do hear so many common threads of those obstacles and opportunities, and we want to continue to hear them. Well, one of those common threads was uh, just talked about by uh, Secretary Acosta, and that's the whole op opioid crisis that I think is affecting just about every county across the United States. And I know you've uh, played a very significant uh, leading role in the administration's efforts to deal with the opioid crisis, including some sig significant legislative initiatives that have, uh, have been put in place, regulatory changes to help uh, uh, local and, and state uh, government officials address this tri crisis. Um, can you talk a little bit about these efforts and any next steps uh, that you're aware of that you can share with us at this point? Yes, sir. Greg, thank you for <clears throat> helping us to raise awareness, not just about the crisis, which we call the crisis next door, but some of the solutions that we're working on together. So we refer to the opioid and drug demand, drug supply crisis in the White House as the crisis next door. So right off the bat, people know a few things. One is it is indiscriminate. It goes across every geographic, demographic, socioeconomic, racial, gender, um, certainly political line. And I can't imagine there's a person in here who comes from any nook and cranny in this country that has not seen the impact of our modern drug crisis, which um, experts say is the worst drug crisis in our nation's history. So what's being done about it? Well, we had HR 6 last year. It was signed into law by the president in October. And it really was a great exercise in bipartisan legisl legislative efforts for a couple of reasons. One is it, it was passed on a bipartisan basis. Every single Democrat who voted, voted in favor of H.R. 6. And that includes every single Democratic senator, including the ones running for president. So I feel like this is an issue that we'll continue to hear about at, at different levels because everybody's already admitted 
it's a problem. It's a problem that affects everyone in this country, and they put their vote and their voice behind that problem, solving that problem. Um, secondly, the HR 6 ended up being a package of different bills mm -hmm. that had been out there on different aspects of the opioid crisis. Everything from the STOP Act, for example, which, will com which now will require our own U.S. Postal Service to do what the third-party carriers like FedEx and Amazon and, and DHL already do, which is ha write down the sender, recipient, and the contents of the package of every foreign origin package. So that should be able to cut down on the number of illicit drug, lethal drug packages that are coming through our own mails and into our communities. It also, HR6 also included some great programs like um, more funding and awareness for the NAS baby. So neonatal abstinence syndrome, an issue that our first lady, Mrs. Melania Trump, who just went on a three-day tour, just left to talk about her Be Best initiative, which includes in the forefront the opiate crisis. The NAS babies, you've probably seen one in 100 babies being born every day, struggling to take those first breaths. The one in 100 approximates about 150 a day nationwide. The one in 100 is about one in 10 in some counties that I visit, and we've heard from those legislators right, left, and center, particularly at the local level. There's money in there for that. There's also some workforce development monies, mm -hmm. and our Secretary of Labor, I missed his remarks, but I certainly am working with him and his team on this issue. The Secretary of Labor and the second lady and our Surgeon General and I had a wonderful opportunity to go out to Belden Industries in Indiana uh, last fall and witness firsthand a really great example of an, of an employer. They're a manufacturer of big coils, Great example, and I know there are others in your own communities, of an employer, right, that instead of saying you, you, you failed your drug test, you're out of here. You can stay on the job, but you must immediately go into treatment and, and also either be reskilled or you know, take a pause in that job. And then when you are able to re-enter, that job is waiting for you because after all, the job is the pathway to recovery along with medication-assisted therapies and so many of the other uh, treatment services that are in HR6. So HR6 came with billions and billions of dollars, but I think most significantly for you, in addition to the money, it was a full spectrum approach on law enforcement interdiction and surveillance, treatment and recovery, prevention and education. And I think what all of you can do, uh, which, which we also do at the federal level, is have a really robust triple down effort on take back day. So National Take Back Day is the last Saturdays of April and October. We have another one coming up in about six or seven weeks. The three Take Back Days that have existed in this presidency, along with our efforts to make, quote, everyday Take Back Day, mm -hmm. has netted 3.7 million pounds of pills since we've gotten here. And I want you to think about that. Just get your head around that, because I work on this every day, and it's hard for me to get my head around. Had you told me 3.7 million pills, I'd be impressed. It's a lot of pills. 3.7 million pounds of pills, which tells you how much of this unnecessary stuff is in our, is in our supply chain. Exactly. So, we, and part of the prevention education in the National Take Back Days, the tech companies have been terrific in helping us. Um, ONDCP has been terrific. They have now ODMAP, overdose map. Hot, you can see the hot spots in your communities. Google, Facebook, they've been helping us to come up with tools so that you can put in your zip code and find the closest place to bring those drugs, those unnecessary drugs. And the prevention education also has to be with the consumers, the students in the schools. We spend an awful lot of time and money teaching our, our kids, our school students, about many different things. Getting this into their curriculum or getting a local leader to go in and just tell them the basics. Fentanyl, make sure they know what fentanyl is. Make sure they know what naloxone and Narcan are. are. And fentanyl is instant killer for many people. It's being laced into marijuana, heroin, meth, cocaine, and of course, street drugs. And it is, it is the biggest reason that the opioid crisis continues to spiral upward in the deaths. Um, and then I would just point out, because you may or may not have this in your own communities, but increasingly when we travel, we see many of our fire stations re-outfitting themselves as places where they can save a life. Somebody who's overdosing, safe stations. They are three, four times more likely in some places to respond to a drug overdose right. than a fire. Exactly. So we have that as well. Um, what's next? I think what I call the opioids plus 
responses are coming up, more workforce development, making sure that these folks, not unlike the criminal justice reform, the First Step Act, trying to get folks who are qualified to re-enter, more money for the drug court programs, the drug-free communities programs this year. We had the highest number of recipients and most money ever awarded uh, to the communities. Um, also, I would say um, the, the veterans piece, working very closely with the VA, because in our rush to make sure our veterans have everything they need, we're handing them two bottles of pills for non-combat related yeah. injuries. And it's tomorrow the president will sign an executive order on suicide prevention in veterans. And this is a piece of that as well. So again, working with you and your communities, um, we have learned, I've learned 98% of what I've learned about the opioid and drug crisis from you not from the federal government. We're here to help in the response, our whole of government response, but that whole of government response is a vertical whole of government. It's federal, state, and local, but it's a whole of government response that really needs to treat the whole person. Well, you kind of made reference to criminal justice reform, and that's the next thing I want to get into. Um, obviously, uh, there's been success with a number of packages, including uh, county priorities and reauthorizing the Second Chance Act. Counties, as you well know, play a very significant role yes. in criminal justice. So we own 91% of the U.S. jails uh, with over 10 million inmates every year. And many of our jails continue to struggle with individuals' mental health and substance use uh, disorders and frequent recidivism. Uh, I know in our county in San Diego and probably in most uh, county jails across the United States, uh, uh, you know, our, our jails, unfortunately, are the largest provider of mental health services in addition to many other things. But could you tell us a little bit about the White House work on this issue and what are some of the big achievements uh, were, that we've seen so far from the administration's perspective. Well, thank you very much for pointing that out. And I had this uh, very conversation with your supervisor, actually, from your county not too long ago on these two issues. Uh, the First Step Act, another great bipartisan accomplishment, um, both Republicans and Democrats. And I think more importantly, people from all across the country came into the Oval Office to watch the signing of that legislation. Um, local leaders who have been working on this for years um, certainly people in the criminal justice space, the health community, um, those who were about to benefit from this. And one of the first ladies' guests was Matthew Charles, probably one of the first and among the most visible now. Um, beneficiaries would be the word of the First Step Act. Uh, I think it's very important to recognize what measures like this provide and what they don't provide. It is not a get out of jail free card for everyone. This is what people have paid their debt to society and they are determined to be ready for re-entry. It is giving them that opportunity. Now, this is something that had been attempted and talked about for many, many years. And I think it's a very good example of will, of putting the politics aside and wondering who's going to win and seeing that many people um, who deserve to win would win. But we know that it is on your shoulders to execute now on measures like the First Step Act, the criminal justice reform, the opioid legislation, the regulations, obviously. And we're here to support those efforts. Um, I think that the workforce development piece on criminal justice reform, the mental health piece, is what SAMHSA is doing um, over at HHS. They freed up a bunch of money um, for this particular purpose. They freed up a bunch of, a bunch of money for veterans mm -hmm. um, for that particular purpose. And always making sure that the substance abuse and mental health, even the foster care, pieces all work together so that we recognize the reality of all the different knitting together. None of this can operate in a silo. I think the workforce development piece is important too. I took note and shared with Jared Kushner, my colleague at the White House, who really took control of this issue on behalf of the administration, um, that I noticed that Sully, the service dog, who of course famously was assigned to um, President George Herbert Walker Bush, God rest his soul, Sully's trainers in part were um, two convicts. That's the way they referred to themselves. I watched them be interviewed. And part of what they did while in prison um, was train Sully. And what a great way of showing what can be done for skilling and education and, and workforce development while in prison. And then when one is qualified to, uh, is ready to come out and reenter. So there are a number, I think, of protective measures in there, but there are also a number of opportunities. And that was signed into law December 21st. So it's fairly new and young. Um, but again, I think just tackling issues, I mean, people ask me what surprises you 
about the White House, and I've been there since day one, and yes, we'll continue to be there. Uh, one is how small the West Wing is. It's a very small place. Um, but number two is not how easy, because none of it is easy, but almost logistically speaking, how simple it would have been for some of these issues to be tackled previously. So that is not a criticism of any previous administration, any previous president. I'm just making the point, looking forward together, that whether it's a regulatory change or a legislative fix or an executive order or a commission that gets started or a state, local, and federal um, effort being done together, it's, we just have to do it. Sometimes it's a matter of will. And I am, I am amazed sometimes when I say, and the president will constantly ask, so do we, is that a, do we have to do this legislation? Can we, do, can we start it here? Can we do an executive order? Can we bring people in? And it is amazing how much you can do if um, you don't care who gets the credit for it. But it's also amazing how much you can do if, unlike in Washington, we all recognize what you recognize back at home, which is stop overestimating how much can get done by this Friday and start under and stop underestimating how much can be done in the next three weeks to three months to three years. And that's the way we're trying to tackle issues like that. It's certainly worth a try. Always willing to fail. Always willing to say it's not time yet. At least if we can do the work and get it ready and then find out you know, where it's ripe. So we know that you've got many challenges on your shoulders and on your budgets. And, um, but we're, we are here to help and we are here to support and we are here, most importantly, I think, to listen. Well, I know, Kelly, and one of the priorities of Pres President Trump has been a regulatory reform. And I know that I had the opportunity, I know there was a few other people in this room uh, two years ago this week, in fact, to be invited to the White House when the President uh, signed uh, an the executive US? order on waters of the United States to send it back to the drawing board. Counties of... Uh, have been you know, focusing on that issue for a good number yes. of years because of the impact it has on our farmers and, and, uh, and our counties, just on infrastructure-related issues and public safety. So we sincerely appreciate all of those efforts uh, to streamline the regulatory uh, process and increase uh, consultations with local governments. Are there more regulatory streamlining issues that you'd like to share with us? There are. Our head of OIRA is now about to get her confirmation hearing well, actually, the vote. Uh, she's now uh, been nominated to replace Brett Kavanaugh in the D.C. A circuit court, uh, but she left. Uh, she's leaving a great staff, and she'll have a replacement soon. But under, I think, Naomi Rao's leadership, with the White House Counsel's Office and others in the administration, and particularly the President, the deregulation, getting rid of the duplicative, excessive, burdensome, unnecessarily expensive. Uh, regulations is something that we hear every single day from farmers, property owners, taxpayer, public school parents, um, certainly local elected officials. So this is not about doing away with regulations that are protecting our safety, our well-being, our, our water and air quality, but quite the opposite. As you say, the waters of the United States, the president will still mention that as a top five, top ten whenever he's asked what are your favorite accomplishments or what were the best deregulations. We very recently had an event in the Oval where we had a coal miner there, we had a farmer there, we had a small business owner there, really just trying to show the, the broad impact of the deregulatory gender. But we can always do better, too. We have, the president has set as a goal, a 5% reduction, I believe it is, across each agency. Some are able to do it faster than others. Um, but there are always, and, and actually his goal was two out for every one in, and it's, it's much better than that. It's, some people say 25 or so, but I'll just say it's much better than two, two gone for every one in. Every agency is different. But I think if you look at labor, you look at Department of Transportation, you look at EPA, SBA certainly, interior, agriculture, these are ones that spring to mind in terms of um, really having a robust projection about what more they can do in this next year or two. Um, all the while, and I think it's important too, I, I've been urging everybody who's involved with this issue, don't just talk about the ones we're that we're eliminating, but talk about the ones that are new also, because we do need smart regulation, we certainly do. And so for, when we talk about 10 out for every new one in, let's also make sure everybody knows what the new one in is and what the purpose of that is and why, because more often than not, we're responding to what we've heard or seen or been told at the local uh, level, the state level also, as to what's important. So that, that is going, the deregulation is going to be, continue to be a very important um, aspect of this administration's policies and, and this president's legacy. 
Uh, and look, it's saving billions of dollars, but I think also it's just, it's just restoring more freedom. It's giving people more choices. We hear from folks that they feel more free now to form a small, the small business formation, the confidence, the property owners don't fear as much. The, um, certainly the farmers, those in ag, manufacturing as well. I think it all, the president is the first to say that yes, the tax cuts were great, they were historic, the repatriation of the wealth, the reducing the corporate tax cuts, et cetera. But he always says, if that hadn't gone with the companion deregulation, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have meant as much to so many. And he also says he thinks that deregulation is just as important, if not more important, to certain industries and sectors and individuals. And he knows that because he hears that. Well, Kellyanne, this has uh, been marvelous. I know the for time me. is just kind thank of uh, blown by, but we sincerely thank you for being here. Uh, we didn't even get a chance to get into the question of infrastructure, but uh, I can say, I think on behalf of all of our NACO members, we know that that's an issue that the, the, the president is interested in focusing on, and perhaps even though there's a divided Congress, that's an issue that can really bring people together. Well, we're very hopeful about that, and I'll just get, spend 20 seconds on it without running into the next speaker's time, because it's so important. When the president had a phone call with Speaker Pelosi about five or six weeks ago, he immediately tweeted out, great call with Speaker Pelosi, and we've committed to working together on drug pricing and infrastructure. And so that was a, 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 amidst um, the other things they were discussing, very much on her mind and his mind. And I can tell you at the, at the White House, our five policy priorities this year, those are two of them. And the drug pricing infrastructure, I know that you all have a hand in those as well. Infrastructure is everything from rural broadband to shrinking the permitting time from eight to 10 years to two years. Mm -hmm. um, certainly the roads, the bridges, the water main breaks, things people aren't even really thinking of every single day. But infrastructure at its heart is a fundamentally local issue. And I know that your members here are charged with the, the, uh, the control and the funding, uh, by and large, too, and the maintenance of roads and bridges and, and streets and parks. And so we hear you, we see you, but that is the next big effort. And I know people like to say, oh, is it infrastructure week again at the White House? My, I know it's a snotty question. My very um, professional answer is yes, because every week is infrastructure week. There you week. go. Good answer. Because every week, um, you're dealing with it back at home, and we're partners with that and, and you. It's good to have a builder in the White House when you're talking about infrastructure week. Um, so thank you very much, and thanks very much for having me today. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. you represent a beautiful part of the country, I can tell you that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, again, we want to thank Kellyanne for being here today. We've had a great partnership with the Trump administration, focusing on issues of concerns to county government. Uh, and I think the Trump administration gets it, that we need strong counties across America. So uh, we look forward to continuing that working relationship. At noon, we're going to meet right back here in this very same room for lunch, uh, which you will not want to miss, because backed by popular demand, we're going to see a, a special performance by the Capitol Steps. You're going to love it because they always do a great job. This concludes our general session. Thank you. If you missed any of the remarks by Senator Ernst, Secretary Acosta, or Kellyanne Conway, you can go to our website, cspan.org, type NACO, N-A-C-O, in the search box to find their remarks. And a look at the U.S. Capitol here on this Monday morning, where the House and 